Grace and peace to you, friends, in the name of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, and good morning. My name is Brett Swanson, pastor of Wauwatosa Presbyterian Church, and we are very glad you are worshiping with us today, whether this is your first Sunday here remote or you've been with us since March. We are glad that you are here because, indeed, all are welcome at Wauwatosa Presbyterian Church. And no matter where you are worshiping with us today from, we are glad that you are here, especially those folks who are worshiping with us by phone. If you have someone in your life who cannot access the internet for whatever reason, but does have a phone, you can invite them to call 414-253-8521 for an audio recording of this exact service available over the phone on demand. Now, today we will celebrate communion. And so I want to invite you, if you've not yet made your preparations to celebrate with us, please do so now. Whatever bread, whatever cup you have available to you in your home will be perfect. So when the time comes, I hope that you will break bread with us and celebrate the Lord's Supper. Speaking of celebrations, last week we welcomed Jim and Sarah Rand back to the church for a time of parade and farewell and Godspeed and lots of love. The traffic went all the way down the road, in fact, blocked some of the access. That would have been, if the cops come, a sermon illustration for years. <laughs> but it was wonderful. If you took any photos or video of that day, please send them to the church office. You could reach out to Cindy in the office about how to do that. You can send them to me directly, too. We're thankful for the flowers today given to us by Faith Rhodes. Flowers are a great way to remember life and love, and today we celebrate the lives of two beloved uh, family members of this congregation. We offer our Christian sympathies and condolences to Martha Brown's family at the passing of her mother, Betty, and to Sharon Polakowski at the passing of her mother, too. Our thoughts and prayers, our love is with them. Speaking of love, I want to show you from last Saturday, I was lucky enough to officiate the wedding of Carrie Bargren, who, as you know, the youngest daughter of Paul and Elizabeth Bargren, married Travis Andrews there at their house last Saturday. It was a blessed event. So lastly, before we get to our service, I do want to remind you that scholarships are now available for those members who are pursuing post-secondary education. The deadline is August 26th, and for more information, you can go on our church website, tosaprez.com, or call the church office. Well, friends, let us worship God. I rise this day in the power of your Holy Spirit, O God. I lift up my hands, my heart, and my songs to praise you, O Christ. Be for me today my Savior my guardian in my weakness, a friend on my journey, and my aim for all I seek to do. Whether the day is bright or gloomy, be my light. Then when the night begins to fall, bid me home, be my home, that I may find my rest in you, O three in one. Amen. is turned away from me, I wrestle with despair. How long, O Lord, will you forsake and leave me in this way? When will you come to my relief? My heart is overwhelmed with grief by evil night and day. But I trust you, your steadfast love, my heart rejoices in you. Salvation source and love, salvation source and love, 
How long, O Lord, will you forget me forever? How long will you hide your face from me? How long must I bear pain in my soul and have sorrow in my heart all day long? How long shall my enemy be exalted over me? Consider and answer me, O Lord my God. Give light to my eyes or I will sleep the sleep of death. And my enemy will say, I have prevailed. My foes will rejoice because I am shaken. But I, I trusted in your steadfast love. My heart shall rejoice in your salvation. I will sing to the Lord because he has dealt bountifully with me. As we begin our time reflecting on our scripture and explore this 13th Psalm. I want to ask you a question. If you were going to honestly answer, how are you doing? What would you say? We're so conditioned to say, oh, okay, I'm fine. I'm good, man. How are you? But think about it. Most folks I know are not doing fine, are not just okay. You know, honestly, most folks I know are anxious and they're worried about sending their kids to school. They're angry. They're upset at the state of things. They wonder if things are just going to get worse as time goes on. They're trying to balance life and being cautious. Cautious? They care about big, big things. Most folks I know care about big, big things outside of themselves, but it's just hard. It's exhausting to get in the good fight, to fight the good fight for justice and love and peace and equality, to get in that good kind of trouble like we hear about from John Lewis, the recently departed civil rights icon. It's hard to get into that good trouble when every single decision just feels so heavy. You know what I mean when I say heavy? Heavy like, you know, it would have been nothing just around Christmas time to jump in the car and run to the store to pick up that coffee creamer that you like so much that you just ran out of. But now you really have to seriously consider the risks to yourself and to others to just get that one thing that makes you just a, that little even bit happier. That's heavy. That's what I mean by heavy. And it's not just COVID-19. That's true. It's not just COVID-19 because people are still dying. People are still suffering. There is still tragedy going on. There are still house fires and there are still hurricanes and there's still diseases that have no cure and terminal diagnosis. There's still everything in the midst of all of this, I read a story the other day about a Houston pastor of a fairly large Baptist church who, on his way home from who knows what, saw a car that had broken down on the side of a busy Texas freeway. He pulled off to the side to help along with somebody else, and along came a semi-truck, hit him. He died instantly and gruesomely. That semi-truck, 18-wheeler, going full speed. He left a family behind. And that kind of stuff is still happening every day. So where is God in all of this? Where is God when we're faced with the realities of life? We're going to eventually, always, arrive at that same question. Why? Where? You know, last week we talked about how God does not send cancer and COVID and car wrecks and cyclones. God does not cheapen your life by using it as a pawn to teach others lessons. But for the faithful, we're always left wondering, we are left wondering that God may not have given folks COVID. God does not give folks COVID, but it also seems like God doesn't provide any answers as to why folks are dying or why some are spared and others are not or why a hurricane can knock down this house but not that house. For the faithful, we're 
wondering. And that wondering is a kind of disorientation. It's true. It's a kind of disorientation because we're all too familiar with disease and death. Maybe not on the scale we see now. Maybe not at the hands of this singular pandemic disease, this virus. But we're all too familiar with death and disease. But the real disorientation is not that. The real crisis is the fact that it seems so often like God is just silent. And as people of faith, we're so often forced to reconcile with that idea, with that truth that God is love and that I am with you to the end of the age and the like with that disorienting, with that deafening silence when you and I are faced with bad things that just keep on happening. So we turn to Scripture. And Psalm 13 is the quintessential Scripture in this time of lament and pain. Have you ever been asked, to account for the silence of your God? Have you ever been asked, hey, you're a Christian, why didn't God stop this? You know, suffering is our focus this Sunday, and I want to give you a bit of a toolkit of sorts to go out into the world and to be a present as a person of faith when suffering is everywhere, to not shy away from it. I want to give you a collection of things to remember when you're being a loved one, when you're being a friend, when you're being a decent person human being as folks are hurting all around you. And Psalm 13 is where we want to start because it captures exactly the question that breaks your and my heart, that endangers our faith, that keeps us so often silent or afraid to look suffering face to face. Psalm 13 asks that fundamental question, just why won't God be God when we need it the most? We heard Susan read, how long, O Lord? You know, when God seems inactive, when God seems silent and distant, that puts God's reputation, God's very identity on the line. If we can't count for you, O God, count on you for this, then what good are you? Silence naturally engenders questions about God. And verse 1 through 4 is asking that question. What is taking so long, oh God? But then 5 and 6, something changes immediately. And the psalmist goes, I will sing. So how do we get there? How do we go from how long, oh Lord, to I will sing? So this is where I want to give you the toolkit for a suffering world. If we want to be clear-eyed, if we want to be honest in both our faith and our understanding of the world, then we're going to need a few tools, a few abilities to do so. If we're going to go live into our faith that God is good and God's promises are sure, and we're going to call a spade a spade when it comes to suffering out in the world, then we are going to need a way to do that. So I want to give you three steps, okay? Number one. If you want to engage suffering in the world honestly, openly, faithfully, then you need to stop asking, why do bad things happen? Maybe that's counterintuitive. We need to stop asking that question for a couple of reasons. And number one is that simply there's just no satisfactory answer and there never will be. If we think that suffering is just this problem, then you and I have always been conditioned to think that every problem has a solution. It has an answer. It's out there somewhere. If just we were smart enough or faithful enough or something enough to decode it or to find it. But Christian faith chooses to not answer that question. It's not equipped to answer the question, why do bad things happen? Our faith can't answer that question in a way that makes it so that you and I can sit in the hospital or stand before the grave any easier, any more peacefully. The psalmist doesn't want God to answer why this is happening. The psalmist just wants God to show up. So step two, we need a better question. We should start asking how should a Christian suffer? Not why should we, but how should we? This, though, is the question that Scripture, that faith, that the community, that the church, that Christ and Scripture are prepared to answer. This is the question we need to remember. 
Because our faith does not explain why we suffer or how to avoid suffering, but our faith seeks to give us a way to suffer ourselves, a way to suffer alongside with the world brokenhearted. The call of our faith is to believe in the midst of suffering, to trust God even as the walls are crumbling, crumbling, even when we are the cause of our own suffering, even when we are frustrated that God is not acting like some sort of lucky rabbit's foot or get out of jail free card, even when we cannot find a suitable answer for our friends, for our loved ones, because the best advice I can give you for how to suffer is that sometimes you just simply have to light that candle, you have to say your prayer, and you just have to curse the ever-living darkness to just get it all out and know that God is still God, even if you're unable to believe right now. So finally, step three, both for ourselves and for others, we need to be better about talking about suffering. This goes back to something we talked about last week and how so often we hear in these times of tragedy and pain that, well, maybe God needed another angel or this must have been part of God's plan, that kind of stuff. I want to give you some tips. I want to give you this tool to be a good friend, to be a blessing to others by how we engage suffering, how we talk about it. So number one, if you want to be better about suffering in the world and in the lives of loved ones, don't offer your own life experience as an example if all the suffering you've ever experienced is by comparison trivial. You know, Kate and my Zoe, our central air conditioning broke. I was told by the HVA techs that it was probably 40 or 50 years old. It totally failed. We cannot fix it. It's donezo. And it broke on what seemed like the hottest day of the year. And so upstairs, it was well above 80 degrees. It was miserable for sure. But if I'm trying to tell that story as a way to relate to someone who lost their house by a fire, I'm going to sound shallow. And you will too. Number two, if you're faced with real suffering, don't resort to some cheap silver lining, redemptive life lesson, one to grow on school of hard knocks kind of decoding and nonsense. The only person who's ever actually helped by, by saying that, oh, you're, you know, that happened because of this, or that happened so you can learn this. The only person who ever is helped by that is us. It gives us peace. You know, there was a church in Chicago that had fallen into disrepair and the facade had these large stones and I think a gargoyle up on the top. And due to years and years and years of inability to pay for necessary repairs, one of the gargoyles fell and it hit a woman on a head, a pedestrian, and she died. And that happened right as the church I was serving was considering how to pay for, how to engage, how to do the work for their own crumbling facade. And for that, it sealed the deal immediately. And somebody said, well, I'm so glad we heard about this. Somebody died. And it's easy to just to turn that into, oh, well, this is a lesson that we can learn, a one to grow on. Don't do that. And number three, lastly, please do not go silver lining. And do not resort to cheap spiritual, spirituality or religious nonsense like just count your blessings or meditate on the good. Jesus' resurrection is a fundamental, overwhelming no to the pain and death in its just never-ending succession. Death does not win. God's love overwhelms the ultimate grip of death and pain, but we will still suffer here and now. So friends, go out into the world remembering that no amount of kumbaya Christian nonsense is ever going to keep the suffering from hurting. It's always going to hurt. We need to stop pretending that it does. If you want to engage suffering in the world as a person of faith, look at it wide-eyed and clear-eyed, knowing that despite it all, God is still there. And let that be your comfort as you engage the suffering of others. Amen.
Friends, I invite you to the joyful feast of the people of God. And if you have yet to make your preparations to break bread with us to get together as the body of Christ, I invite you to pause and do so now. Friends, make your preparations so that we may celebrate together. Friends, people will come from east and west and north and south to gather around this table to break bread, to proclaim that Jesus is Lord, that the grip of death does not have the last word, that the bread of life and the cup of salvation will sustain us for our lives out in the world, clear-eyed, truth-telling lies about the state of things and who and whose we are. All are invited to taste and see that the Lord is good. If you Place your trust in Christ if you seek to, if you are wondering and curious about the love of God. Break bread with us now. We're told that when those who dine with Christ do so, their eyes are indeed open. So friends, as we prepare to break this bread and celebrate this cup, I invite you to pray with us together. Let us pray. God of spirit and flesh, God of heaven and earth, God of grape and grain, we spread our wings in flight toward you. We stretch our arms in need of you. We feed ourselves with gifts from you. We thank you for your love poured out as we sense your spirit shining in the sunlight, sailing on the summer wind, and singing in the souls of each one gathered. Recreate us in your image as we encounter you today, that our lives may ignite a love to light the world, where despair drips dreary on our dreams and where heavy hearts shiver lonely cold. Let your presence pressing through us infuse the world with joy. We pray. Amen. Friends, on the night of our Savior's arrest, he sat at table, Christ sat at table with his disciples, and there amongst them he took the loaf of bread and he broke it. And he gave it to them, saying, Take, eat, this is my body, broken for you. Do this in remembrance of me. And in much the same way, Christ filled the cup, saying, This is the cup of a new covenant, a cup sealed in my blood for the forgiveness of sins. Do this in remembrance of me. And so it is, friends, that whenever we eat this bread and whenever we drink from this cup, we proclaim the saving death of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, until he comes again in all power and in all glory. Friends, these are the gifts of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. And so I invite you to celebrate with me. Friends, the bread of life and the cup of salvation. Friends, I invite you to pray with me. We lift our hearts to you, O God, as mighty one, who by the word of your mouth recreated the heavens and the earth, and as the merciful one who gives us the right address as we speak to you by name, Jesus Christ, Son, Lord. 
We lift our hearts to you because there is no one else to whom we can turn, no one else who has the words of eternal life. We ask you to come and enter the circumstances of our lives that bring such pain and confusion, to enter the lives of our brothers and sisters who suffer, to enter the lives of those who live in darkness. We pray today for those within our local families who are in need, who need an extra measure of grace and mercy. Some have fallen and need you to lift them up again, O Lord. Some sorrow and need your comfort. Some experience broken relationships and need your grace. Some comfort major diseases and this virus and need your hand for strength and healing. Still others confront their own doubt and confusion and need your spirit to soothe their hearts. Many live with the loneliness and grief of a loved one's taken away by death. We pray for those who require that sustaining da grace daily. We pray to you for our community and those within it who feel such needs for mercy. We hold up before you now all those who have been affected in this pandemic. For the families of those who have lost senior loved ones, for those who are hospitalized and those who will never recover. We remember their families. We remember the families of this own church, our family of faith. We pray for those who are experiencing life's transitions and residents of nursing care facilities, those affected by illness, our students, our medical professionals and members and friends of this congregation, friends like Amy and Maggie. We pray for the family of Betty Brown, Martha Brown's mother who passed away, for Jay Costello and Bob DeGroote, Virginia Doherty, Ellen Ferguson, Norma Fernhaber, John Freed, Jane La Jean Lawson, Tony Katsoon and family, Pauline Kilhefner, Jean Koch, Sharon Polakowski's family as they mourn the loss of her mother, Carol. We pray for Dave and Mary Roberts, Faith Rhodes, and Roy Wetter. We also pray for the members of Narcotics Anonymous and other support groups who are unable to meet during this time. We pray for those who are incarcerated. We pray for those who have included their petitions in our community prayer box. We lift them up now and pray for Davy and Margaret, Patty and Rose, and all those who are in need of healing. We pray for the safe start of the school year. We pray for the unity of the church. And we pray for the many prayers and petitions that go unspoken. And so now, friends, we pray for the world. Such a mixture of truth and falsehood, light and darkness, love and hate, Bring, we pray, the light of your presence into the middle of our society. Bring the healing power of justice and truth. May the leaders of our nations lead us to live together in harmony. Promote the causes of peace and reconciliation. But most of all, O oh Lord, open the doors for the proclamation of love and truth and the Prince of Peace, Christ. May the light of salvation in Christ overcome the shadows of darkness, selfishness, immorality, violence that hover over our land and threaten its future. So with the boldness of the children of God, let us pray the prayer that Christ gave the church. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Friends, as you go out into the world, throw away all of the trite cliche realities about what we say about suffering. Throw away those ones to grow on, throw away the silver linings, and be present. Our faith instructs us how to suffer. Our faith tells us that we should partner and walk with others. Our faith tells us that God is still God, and we are knit together. I hope you'll use this toolkit we've offered today as a way to 
engage faithfully the suffering of the world and maybe of your own. Friends, God is with you. Indeed, may the love of God and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit and the example of Jesus Christ, our risen Savior, be with you now and always, friends. Go in God's peace. Amen.